You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In July 1944, a Jewish couple named Vilmos and Jolie Gabor were stuck in Nazi-occupied Hungary. At that moment, the Nazis were busy rounding up Hungarian Jews and deporting them to concentration camps like Auschwitz. But the Gabors were lucky to have a daughter living in the U.S., and she was rich and famous. So when she asked the U.S. government to help, word was passed on to a new organization called the War Refugee Board, which successfully extracted the Gabors to safety in Portugal. And that's how the famous Hollywood actress Zsa Zsa Gabor, with the help of the WRB, rescued her parents from the Nazis. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 86, in which we learn the amazing story of the War Refugee Board, a U.S. government organization that helped save tens of thousands of Jews from the Nazis in the latter part of World War II. We are coming to you this week from the Henry Morgenthau Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. The person running this whole show, of course, is our wonderful executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, I'm with my very large and delightful family for an annual week at a beach house on the Massachusetts coast just north of Boston. I'm one of seven kids, so when all my siblings and their families and my wife and my children gather, it's a big crowd, somewhere around 35 people. And with a recent spate of weddings and babies, it'll be 40 before long. Years ago, we used to rent one huge house but now we rent three medium-sized ones. The whole thing is just a blast, with lots of food and beer, hanging on the beach and catching up, and traditions like tie-dyeing t-shirts and walking around the corner to get the most fabulous lobster rolls and ice cream in the world. I'm sure you're wondering, how on earth is he podcasting from a beach house? Well, I'm actually sitting in a closet, with blankets and comforters and pillows strewn here and there, and it seems to be working out just fine. But all this fun at the beach will soon come to an end, and reality will reassert itself. Monday, August 13th, it's back to the college, where my new duties as chair of the history department will really kick in. But between now and then, let's pop out another podcast episode. This week, I speak with historian Rebecca Erbelding about her new book. It's titled Rescue Board, and it tells the incredible and largely unknown story of a special unit created by the U.S. government in 1944 during World War II to rescue European Jews from the Nazi extermination program. All right, all I've got left to say is, please consider supporting the podcast by purchasing some of our merchandise. We have over 50 t-shirts with history-related quotes from famous people like Abraham Lincoln and Confucius. And we have shirts with many variations on the theme of being opposed to history repeating itself, like historians against history repeating itself or history majors against history repeating itself. There's a lot to check out. And all these designs come not only as t-shirts, but as all kinds of clothing, hoodies and such, but then also as keychains, mugs, stickers, you name it. And remember, all the profits from every sale go directly to supporting the podcast. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on merchandise. The other way to support In the Past Lane, of course, is by a donation through Patreon or PayPal. We have some new Patreon supporters. Thanks so much to Shane C. and Pauline R. I really appreciate your generosity and support. And here's the really exciting part. We are now just a few Patreon supporters away from allowing me to send one episode a month off to an editing service. This will save me a huge amount of time, which will allow me to continue the podcast and keep improving it. So if you've been thinking about supporting the In the Past Lane podcast, even for as little as $1 a month, now would be a terrific time to do it. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on support. Thanks. Okay, people, time to put your affairs in order. 
we're parachuting into Nazi-occupied Europe. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Many people know the story of the St. Louis. That was the vessel filled with 900 Jewish refugees from Nazi persecution that arrived off the shores of the United States in 1939. Despite desperate pleas from humanitarian organizations to allow the ship to land, U.S. officials pointed to immigration restriction laws adopted in the 1920s and turned the St. Louis away. The vessel eventually returned to Europe, where, in the coming years, about one quarter of the 900 passengers were killed by the Nazis. Not surprisingly, this extraordinary example of moral failure on the part of the United States government has long been cited as an example of a far larger record of moral indifference when evaluating the U.S. response to the Holocaust. And there's a lot of truth in this indictment. There's a lot of evidence in the historical record that indicates the U.S. government knew a lot about the Holocaust, and on a number of occasions, chose to do nothing to intervene, like, say, bombing the railroad lines that led to Nazi death camps. But, just because the United States could have done more to aid the Jewish victims of the Nazi genocide, it doesn't mean the United States did nothing. This fact is made clear in the story of the War Refugee Board, a special unit of the U.S. government that likely saved the lives of tens of thousands of Jews in Europe in the last year and a half of World War II. To learn more about this incredible story, I'm joined today by Rebecca Erbelding. She is an archivist, curator, and historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And she's the author of a new book, Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. Rebecca Erbelding, welcome to In the Pass Lane. Thank you so much for having me. Well, the story of the Rescue Board that you chronicle in your book really begins in January 1944. But I think it would be helpful for our listeners if you could provide some background on the history leading up to that point. In particular, if you could sketch out the key details regarding U.S. immigration and refugee policy in the 30s, which is before the war starts, and then how that continues into the 1940s once the war begins to rage and you know millions of people are displaced and seek refuge from the Nazi onslaught. So what's happening in the years leading up to the point when the War Refugee Board is created? I think it's really surprising when people learn that the U.S. actually passes no major immigration legislation in the 1930s to keep European Jews out of the country. They don't need to. The immigration law from 1924, the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, does that just fine. And so there are new, no new laws in the 1930s. There's also no refugee policy to speak of. People fleeing persecution in the 1930s, the only thing that makes them different from other immigrants is that they theoretically don't have to pass a literacy test. Other than that, you are in the same line as everybody else and need to submit the same paperwork as everyone else, as people who are trying to immigrate for economic reasons, for example. So the 1924 immigration law is really the thing that ends mass immigration to the U.S. It sets national origins quotas which is a cap on the number of people who were born in any specific country who could immigrate in a specific year. Germany actually had the second highest quota of any country in the world. After 1929, 25,957 people who were born in Germany could immigrate to the U.S. each year. That is out of a total of quota immigration of about 153,000. So 85 percent of the quota is for people who were born in either Great Britain or Germany. Right. But in 1929, the Great Depression begins, and immigration slows almost to a halt in early 19, the early 1930s. In 1933, only about 8,000 immigrants come to the U.S. at all from any country. And that, of course, is the year that Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany, that Roosevelt is inaugurated here in the U.S. This is a period of economic devastation that we really can't fathom today. 25% of the American workforce is unemployed in 1933, four years, almost four years into the Depression. And that really colors our immigration policy. Throughout the entirety of the Nazi regime from 1933 to 45, our immigration policy is dominated by two issues, the Great Depression first and World War II second. And so... This means there's very little immigration coming into the country. And I guess one question in the back of my mind was it's a combination of the Great Depression, but it's also within that is also a, a high degree of xenophobia that yeah. between those two things keeps people very hostile to the idea of changing our immigration laws, increasing our immigration levels for anybody, uh, let alone yeah. you know one particular group. Yes, yeah, that is absolutely correct. And then in 1939, the, the, the war breaks out and obviously as the 
the crisis unfolds in Europe, there's massive numbers of people displaced. And this is really where the big question comes up in, in this broad studies of World War II and the Holocaust and so forth, particularly from the U.S. side of things, which is, it's kind of a burning question. What did the U.S., both individual people and the officials in power, what did they know about the Nazi plan to exterminate the Jews of Europe? This is a big question because it leads, it plays right into the next question, which is what did the U.S. do? What did it not do? And why did it seemingly mm -hmm. do very little? And so what does the U.S. know and how does this awareness unfold as the war unfolds? Yeah, the U.S. knows a lot. There are about 2,000 newspapers who are daily newspapers published in the U.S., and most of them covered the Nazi regime. As early as 1933, Americans can read about book burning. They can read about the Nazi boycott of Jewish businesses. They can read about the opening of Dachau in April 1933, the Dachau concentration camp. Mm -hmm. But what Americans don't know and, and what the Nazis don't know is that this is going to end in a genocide. And so Americans see this news as, you know, a minority being persecuted overseas, perhaps for, for many Americans, especially those who themselves might be xenophobic or anti-Semitic. They don't see this as anything different from pogroms that had happened at the turn of the century in Russia. This is just a period of time in which anti-Semitism is at a high overseas and people are suffering because of it. It's really Kristallnacht. The Kristallnacht attacks in November 1938 when Nazi Germany orchestrated a series of attacks against Jewish businesses, burning synagogues across the greater German Reich, which by that point included Austria that really Americans start paying attention. Mm -hmm. Kristallnacht is front page news in the U.S. for about three weeks, which is really striking because it's two days after the congressional midterms and it coincides with the 20th anniversary of the end of World War I. This is a period of time when Americans are incredibly isolationist. Most Americans in the 1930s, polling shows us, don't think that we should have gotten involved in World War I at all. Right. So they're certainly not interested in getting involved in what seems like a likely second world war. No, definitely not. Yeah. And so when war breaks out, you know, Americans maintain that feeling of neutrality for a long time. One of the big things that you see is that Roosevelt starts using a lot of political capital to move the country onto a war footing, to have a peacetime draft, to pass Lend-Lease. He's not using that political capital to open up immigration, right. in part because you know, there's still some economic fears. There's a lot of xenophobia. And there's the idea that refugees, people fleeing Nazi Germany, could be spies or saboteurs. Right. Something that we hear today in modern times, not to get ahead of ourselves. No, I mean, it, these are evergreen questions. A lot of the stuff that's going on in the 1930s had happened before and, and happens again in American history, is a fear of bringing in people who might be considered a threat. And in this case, if these people are a threat, it might pull us into the war. And Americans do not want to be in the war. And so for more than two years, polling shows us that Americans only slowly warm up to the idea that they may need to go to war to defend democracy. And it takes until Pearl Harbor for Nazi Germany to then declare war on us and then we declare war on them. By that time, so by 1941, it is almost impossible to get out of Europe if you're a refugee. The U.S. consulates in Nazi territory had closed in July. So even before we get involved in the war, the U.S. has not really a, a diplomatic presence or at least not people who can sign visa paperwork anymore mm -hmm. in Nazi territory. And so if you want to get out, you need to find an American diplomat who can give you permission to come to give you that all-important visa. You also need a ship ticket. And at a time of submarine warfare, there are very few ships crossing the Atlantic, and most of them are crossing out of Lisbon. And so what you see is this incredible difficulty, both it's U.S. bureaucracy, it's Nazi bureaucracy, and it's the reality of war. It's having to traverse war-torn areas to try to escape. So the U.S. gets involved in the war. About a year later, Americans read for the first time of the idea of a Nazi plan for mass murder. There had been rumors, there were things in American newspapers, but most Americans saw that and thought it could be war propaganda. You know, this is, right. this is a way to draw us into the war, is to make our enemy say our enemy is murdering children. There's not an idea that such a thing was possible, that there could be a mass murder plan. So it's not until November 1942 that it's in the papers. Right. And you chronicle the work of various people in Europe to, who try to get the story out and get the story. Gerhard Reiner is, is one of them. Mm -hmm. Tell us about who are the, the key people and what are they, how do they get the word 
not just to the U.S. and to some newspapers, but into the State Department and the resistance that the State Department puts up. And so tell us more about that and why the State Department is resistant to finding out the details of this plan to exterminate the Jews of Europe. Yeah, so Gerhard Rigner is German-Jewish. He is a law student. Well, no, I think he's a lawyer at this point. Yeah, he's a lawyer at this point. And he is the World Jewish Congress's representative in Switzerland. He hears the information that the Nazis are planning to gather together all of the Jews of Europe in Nazi-occupied Poland and murder them in the fall of 1942. We know now that some of that had been going on. You know, since 1941, the Nazis had been murdering people en masse in occupied Poland and in the Soviet Union. And so Rigner's a little bit behind on that. He hears this third hand. So it's kind of a game of telephone, the information. Mm -hmm. But he passes it on to the State Department with the intention of, of working through them to get it to his boss, Stephen Wise, who is the head of the World Jewish Congress and lived in New York. So he gives the information to the State Department. The State Department passes it on to the Washington office. Remember that Switzerland is entirely surrounded by enemy territory. So it's not like Rigner can just drop a letter in the mail and expect mm -hmm. it to get to the U.S. That's not possible. So he sends it through the State Department. The State Department blocks the information from Wise. They argue that it is a war rumor, that there's no information to verify this. And, and this is the part that I think is especially telling. One State Department official says, even if this is true, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. So their argument that there's just bigger tasks at hand in, in fighting and winning the war overall, and that this is a, well, even if it is true, it's it's tragic, but it's smaller compared to the larger picture, I guess, is the, the way that they saw it. Right. And would it be safe to say that this is kind of one of the key things that drew you into this topic, which was there is this prevailing narrative that is partially true, which is that the United States knew a lot about what was going on uh, in Nazi Germany and, and throughout Nazi-occupied Germany, particularly regarding the extermination plan as it, as it unfolded. And the par second part of that is that the U.S., knowing this, did nothing. And right. it seems that one of your motivations is to say, well, you, it's fair to say the U.S. could have done a lot more and could have acted yeah. sooner and, you know, lots of second guessing. But to say they did nothing is really a false and in many ways damaging narrative. Is my read on that correct, that you are seeking to kind of illuminate this hidden chapter of uh, history to show that the U.S. could be faulted in certain ways, but definitely did some extraordinary things once they got in motion? Yes, absolutely. The U.S. could have done more. But the story that people tend to understand that you just laid out allows us to just kind of look at the Holocaust and say, well, there's nothing, that was a failure. There's nothing we can learn from that. And my argument is actually there's a lot that we can learn from that because the narrative of the U.S. knowing information and not doing anything about it takes a curve in 1944. It is not a straight trajectory. There are people who actively and successfully argue that the U.S. needs to have a humanitarian policy and that we need to try to rescue people. And if that is something that we want to repeat in subsequent humanitarian crises, we can't just dismiss the Holocaust and dismiss these efforts of these men and women. This is a really important story and an interesting one. None of the things that people discuss today in terms of humanitarian crises, none of that's new. There are episodes that we can look back on in the story of the Holocaust and look and see what some government officials were trying to do. Their successes, their failures, and we can learn from those things. But we can't if we forgot about it. Exactly. So this is a good point to plunge into telling us exactly what this organization, the War Refugee Board, how it came to be beginning with that fateful meeting of various officials from the Treasury Department who sit down with President Franklin Roosevelt and lay out the problem and a propose that the, his administration take action, direct action mm -hmm. to aid vulnerable people in Europe. Tell us how that worked. So the War Refugee Board is really created from two kind of threads. One is that after the information about Nazi atrocities reaches the press, there's a sustained campaign that, that kind of rouses the interest of the American people to do something about it. There are pageants, there's rallies and marches and stage shows and full-page newspaper ads condemning the State Department, calling on Roosevelt to do something. So there is public interest, at least in some segments of the population, of doing something to help these people. Very few people have any idea what could be done, but something. There's an idea that we need to do something. And then the Treasury Department starts investigating the State Department. 
Treasury gets involved because this was the first, really one of the first times in American history that we used economic sanctions Mm -hmm. during World War II. And so the Treasury Department needed to approve humanitarian aid money that was going to go to Europe. They needed to issue a license. It's the same thing that they do now whenever there's a non-governmental agency, a a refugee or relief organization that wants to send money into an enemy country. They need permission from the Treasury Department. So the Treasury Department is looking at a request from the World Jewish Congress to send $25,000 in aid money to France and Romania. They slowly decide that they will approve this license. The State Department, on the other hand, keeps trying to block it. They say that the British are our allies and they don't agree with this, or the money is almost certainly going to fall into the hands of the enemy, so we should not approve this small amount of money. And while the Treasury Department starts writing memos explaining, you know, why these delays are happening and and kind of protesting to the State Department, they discover that not only was the State Department delaying this money, that some officials in the State Department had actually instructed the U.S. diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about mass murder to the U.S. That if the American people don't know about what's going on, this was their logic, then they won't pressure the U.S. government to do anything about it. Right. And the State Department felt that it was a diversion from the war. And so the Treasury Department decides to bypass arguing with the State Department and go straight to Roosevelt. One staff member writes a memo entitled The Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jews. Yeah, it's an extraordinary title. For a government report, yes. Government reports are very dry. And this one is not. This one is fire. And so they, you know, they accuse people by name of trying to obstruct information, trying to obstruct rescue, and they end up changing the title and making it less salacious before it gets to Roosevelt. By the time it gets to Roosevelt, it's called personal report to the president, and Mm -hmm. he never even reads it. He doesn't keep his copy. But on January 16th, 1944, the Treasury Department staff members go to Roosevelt and they say, you know, this is going to be your legacy. If you don't stop this and we propose removing refugee matters, what were called refugee matters from Mm -hmm. the State Department entirely, and they brought with them the text of an executive order that they wanted him to sign, creating a new government agency tasked with rescuing Jews during the Holocaust. They didn't call it the Holocaust and it was, you know, Jews and other persecuted minorities. But Mm -hmm. Roosevelt agrees almost immediately. And from then on, the U.S has, for the first time, a policy about the Holocaust, and it's a policy of rescue and relief. Right. And so this, at this point, it's what, January 1944. People don't know that the war has 17, 18 months to go. So they go into fast action. Mm-hmm. And they have pretty good budget, but they're also, it's kind of a ragtag operation, and it's filled with all kinds of colorful characters and incredibly resourceful people that are really committed to the cause, and they're willing to bend rules and you know, break rules and do all kinds of interesting things. So John Peel is the head of this organization. And you write that he has a two-pronged strategy. One is involves propaganda. Mm-hmm. And then the other is the more practical efforts to actually save people, keep people alive in Nazi-occupied areas of Europe, but also to move people out of areas when that becomes possible. So Tell us about both these strategies pursued by Peel and, and some of the ways in which they carried them out. Yeah, his name is actually pronounced Paley. It took me a while to Paley, figure that okay. out. Yeah, because it's, it's not intuitive. It's P-E-H-L-E, and it's pronounced Paley. Paley, all right, John Paley. He was of German extract. His father had immigrated as a teenager from Germany, which is kind of interesting. And he grew up in Nebraska, as opposed to a lot of the people at the State Department who were, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Groton. Right. And that is one of the things that made the Treasury Department different. That's partly why this effort comes from them. And because Henry Morgenthau, the secretary of the Treasury, was a close friend of Roosevelt and the only Jewish cabinet secretary. Right. So the first thing that the board does actually is that is they survey humanitarian aid organizations. They survey Jewish organizations and people who had been raising money to try to help refugees or food assistance, clothing assistance, you know, these small things that that organizations could do. They send out more than 100 letters asking, hey, we're a new organization. What should we do? Which is kind of extraordinary for a government agency to be asking for help, asking for ideas. And they explored almost every suggestion that they were given. 
And a big one was psychological warfare. Try to get the Nazis and their collaborationist perpetrators to stop killing. This reaches a peak in Hungary. So when the board is created in January, Hungary had the largest and last intact, fairly intact, Jewish community in Europe. There are about 800,000 Jews still in Hungary. Hungary was not an occupied territory. In March, the Nazis occupy Hungary, invade and occupy Hungary. And so this community is threatened almost immediately. And Paley and his colleagues try really hard to focus their information, focus their efforts on these would-be Hungarian perpetrators, making arguments like, why would you become a war criminal now? It seems obvious that the Allies are going to win. We're hopefully going to win by the end of 1944. You know, why subject yourself to post-war justice? And we will try you after the war. We will bring you to justice. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say how successful that was. And so how do they get that word to them? You know, how do you do that in a war? Uh, How do you get the drugstore owner and the baker and the policeman in Hungary who might be perpetrators? How do you get that word to them that they should think twice about it, if only for their own self-preservation? Radio broadcasts and leaflets. So their first message is from Roosevelt. They craft something and the president issues this statement. And then they find prominent Hungarian Americans, Catholic bishops and Hungarian actors and people who had immigrated appealing to their countrymen. It's not included in the book, but I actually interviewed an elderly German man who remembers as a teenager finding one of the leaflets after a bombing raid over over the area. Really? Yeah, and, it, and he remembers that leaflet, that particular one. It's how he found out about the Holocaust. The Allies were mm. really smart about how they did these sorts of things. So there'd be the text of the warning, and then right next to it, it would be reports on recent air raids, recent attacks in that local area. And so you'd look at it and you'd say, well, I know that those places were attacked. So that's definitely true. And maybe this information might be true as well. So that is how he says he learned about the Holocaust, which is kind of amazing. It is. And this is an interesting question, really an unanswerable question, because in some cases with the second half of the effort or the second part two of the strategy of the WRB, that's moving people and saving people. You can actually count some people. right? But in this case, you can't, you don't know you have a hunch as a historian, and stories like that do indicate that people found these leaflets and read them. So it's hard to know how many people were dissuaded from carrying out atrocities and therefore how many people were saved. But there's a pretty good, I guess, intuition that says probably many people were spared yeah. because of this leaflet program and this this propaganda program. I mean, at the same time, this is of the 800,000, 437,000 Hungarian Jews end up at Auschwitz in about six weeks seven weeks Mm. in 1944. So the board is not entirely successful, but Hungarians are not in charge in Hungary in the spring of 1944. It's the Germans. Um, Mm. It's the Nazis. And so a lot of what the board is trying to do are thwarted, even if there are Hungarians who are willing to assist or at least call off murder, they're not in charge. The Nazis are. And, you know, the war has a huge impact on anything that the board can do. And that is that feeds directly into the second strategy, which is keeping people alive long enough to be liberated and moving people who are on the margins of Nazi territory away from areas of danger. And so one of the things that I tried to do with the book is to keep it vaguely chronological or mostly chronological because rescue changes before and after D-Day. You know, where the armies Mm -hmm. are make a difference on who you can reach, who you can get to, who you can liberate. In the spring of 1944, The board has a representative in Turkey, and he is negotiating with all sorts of governments, with the British, with the Turks, with Romanians and Bulgarians, with Soviets, to try to get refugees out of Romania and Bulgaria and into Palestine, which is now the state of Israel. And that involved massive negotiations. But by the summer of 1944, in the summer of 1944, Romania and Bulgaria switched sides. And so they've spent this time moving them away from Nazi territory, and then suddenly it's not Nazi territory anymore. It's still kind of amazing that he manages to get about 8,000 people out and into Palestine during this time. They're paying border guards between the border of France and Spain. They are trying to get people before Hungary is invaded. They're trying to get people from Poland to Hungary. You know, the board is trying to do everything they can to move people out of the areas of greatest danger. And then for people who are in concentration camps, who who obviously cannot get out, the board is trying to keep them alive. 
also they send, you know, medical supplies into the Ravensbrück concentration camp, which is a majority female camp and had no real medical facility for prisoners, not one that, that was that helpful. So they're trying to get supplies into the hands of prisoner doctors, mm -hmm. women who were being imprisoned and could take care of their comrades. They have a massive plan that doesn't really come into effect until the end of, towards the end of the war, to get 300,000 food packages into concentration camps. We know now that most survivors, if they remember getting a food package towards the end of the war, that it almost certainly came from the U.S., was paid for by the U.S., was shipped from the U.S., and then disguised as a Red Cross package. That was part of their plan to keep people alive. Right. That's a good example of the kind of wide-ranging things they did, yeah. everything from food packages to disinformation campaigns. There's ransom negotiations. Yeah, exactly. So tell us about Roswell McClellan. He's another one of these interesting people that, you know, does really incredible off-the-book kind of things to ultimately save many, many people. Tell us about his negotiations and this incredible story of Nazis sort of holding Jewish people for ransom, essentially, in the midst of the war. So Ross McClelland is Roswell, went by, he went by Ross to his friends, and I feel like I know him well enough that I can call him Ross, too. <laughs> um, yes. Ross McClelland worked for the American Friends Service Committee, which is the Quaker aid organization. In the 1930s, the Quakers, after Kristallnacht, actually, the Quakers started a refugee division. And so he worked in Europe aiding individual refugees who were trying to get to the U.S which put him, you know, and this is how I begin the book, it put him in a French internment camp in 1942. In southern France, the U.S. still had diplomatic relations. It was a collaborationist area, but not, not the occupied. And so the Quakers were able to work inside internment camps. And so Ross is there in the summer of 1942 witnessing deportations to Auschwitz. By the time that the War Refugee Board is created, he and his wife had escaped to Switzerland. And so he's one of the only Americans who is not working for the U.S. consulate in the State Department already who could work for the War Refugee Board. So he's hired basically because he's in Switzerland. At that point, he's 30 years old. That's it. Mm. And he is in charge of probably the most difficult War Refugee Board post. There's so much intelligence coming in and out of Switzerland. There are so many relief organizations who are working inside the country. And so he has to negotiate and deal with all of them. And in the summer of 1944, the Nazis, first through Turkey and then through Switzerland, offer what we now kind of call Jews for sale. Yeah. The Nazis had noticed that the Americans were interested in trying to rescue people. And so they decided that they weren't going to let them go for free. And they first offer a group of Hungarian Jews for, you know, a bunch of kind of nominal things, cocoa, tons of cocoa and coffee and tea, but also 10,000 trucks. Mm -hmm. And the Nazis promised, they promised Pinky Swear that they will only use the trucks against the Eastern Front, against the Soviets, not against the Americans, not against the British, kind of trying to convince the Americans to give them the trucks in exchange for, for the Jews. Obviously, that is never going to happen. That would just be a split in the Allies, and the Soviets knew all about these negotiations. And so, of mm -hmm. course, that would have been catastrophic for the war had the U.S. tried to do it. But the Americans do recognize that maybe they can string the Nazis along. So starting in August 1944, McClelland and Sally Meyer, who was the representative of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, he was a Swiss lace manufacturer, middle-aged man, start negotiating with high-ranking SS officers in exchange for Jewish lives. Meyer and the SS meet on the border between Germany and Switzerland on a bridge on the border crossing because mm -hmm. Meyer is obviously not going into Germany and they can't come into Switzerland. So they meet on the border and they start negotiating. And Meyer and McClelland managed to string them along until really February 1945. And they get almost 2,000 Jews released from Bergen-Belsen as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis, released to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. This culminates at one point in November 1944, McClelland goes to Zurich and meets with the SS in a hotel in Zurich. It is really kind of phenomenal. He never tells the Washington office, the War Refugee Board in Washington, that he's ever done this. It's something that only comes out after the war. But during World War II, an American official negotiated on humanitarian issues with an SS officer 
And that is a story we've we've almost entirely forgotten. And he did manage to get, as you say, almost 2,000 people released. So it's an undercover story and kind of an off the, off the grid, off the books kind of a story, but a good example of the kind of resourcefulness of some of these people involved with the WRB. And less dramatically, the WRB also opens a camp, a uh, refugee camp in the United States, mm-hmm. in upstate New York. And what's the idea? That's both humanitarian, but that's also symbolic, too. Yeah, it was, it was about leverage, largely. One of the things that the board wanted to do is convince neutral countries and allied countries to accept more refugees. And a lot of them were pointing at the U.S. and calling us hypocrites. When Nicaragua is informed that the U.S. has this new agency and that they're going to try to to rescue Jews, the Nicaraguan government responds that they too will accept refugees in the same number proportionate to the U.S. as a proportion of population. So basically calling our bluff. You know, you say you want refugees, you haven't taken any. So it's partly a token gesture and was called so at the time a way to show that the U.S. is willing to take refugees, that they're willing to ship them across the Atlantic and put them up. It was a strong gesture to show that the U.S. was willing to accept people. Is there any other part of their effort that we need to know about? Um, One of the initiatives involves what you term money laundering to get money, uh, actually to help transfer Jewish refugees into Sweden. And that involves a U.S. company sort of off the books helping out behind the scenes And it's a good example of that kind of by any means necessary effort. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and how they they had money, but in this case, they needed to to hide this money? Yeah, this is one of my favorite stories, in part because nobody had found this story. And it was it has been completely scrubbed from the War Refugee Board's records. Their records are up at the FDR Library at Hyde Park. But Henry Morgan Zhao Jr., the Secretary of the Treasury, received a briefing folder every day of some of the board's correspondence and they forgot to scrub his record. Oh. And so the, the documents that show that this happened are in Morgenthau's record and in one line in the financial ledger that just says Goodyear Tire. Mm-hmm. So these people, the people who ran the war refugee board, John Paley in particular, had been in charge of economic sanctions for the Treasury Department, keeping money outside of Nazi hands, making sure businesses weren't sending money to, to the wrong place during the war. And so they must have been very surprised in the summer of 1944 when the War Refugee Board contacted Goodyear Tire in Akron, Ohio, and said, we need to sneak money into Sweden. If we give you $50,000, will you transfer the equivalent from your factory in Sweden to our representative? His name was Ivor Olson. Will you transfer that money to him? And Goodyear Tire said yes. And so Ivor Olson got $50,000 worth of Swedish kroner without the Swedish government noticing that this was happening, that the U.S. was funding unregulated refugee entry into the country. Mm -hmm. They used the money to buy guns and boats that underground groups used to take to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania to bring back refugees. It is kind of amazing that the U.S., I don't know, I use the term money laundering. The Treasury Department, I think, is a little more specific about what they mean by money laundering, and they don't maybe like the idea of the U.S. government doing this. They prefer, I think, secret money transfers. <laughs> so we can all agree on secret money transfers, because it is definitely that. Exactly. Well, in the end, um, this is, a, as we say, a, a story that has many details, but it plays out over 20 months or so. In the end, we don't know all these details about the money. We also don't necessarily know how many people were saved, but it's safe to say tens of thousands of people were likely saved by the efforts of this this organization. Is that a fair assessment? And what else, by way of sort of wrapping up this fascinating discussion, what else is, is significant about the board and the work that it's done and the fact that the story, you've sort of pulled this story from the, out of the, <laughs> the dark corners of, chapters yeah. of history where it's sort of forgotten and pulled it back into the light. So in terms of the, the larger impact of the board and then why it's an important story now. Yeah, the board staff estimated that they saved tens of thousands. I think that's, that's about right. Some historians have estimated as many as 200,000. I think that might be a stretch. In some cases, that's because they're, they credit the board with saving the remaining Jews of Budapest. Because the board, among other things, in, in a story that we didn't even touch on, the board selects Raoul Wallenberg, the famous Swedish businessman who goes to Budapest in 1944 and tries to save Hungarian Jews. The Holocaust Museum, where I work, is on Raoul Wallenberg Place. The War Refugee Board estimates itself that they saved tens of thousands and assisted hundreds of thousands. That's in their final report. I think that's probably Mm -hmm. about right. 
the board is really one of the only times in, in U.S. history, if not the only time, that the United States does this that we create an agency designed to rescue people who are falling victim to our wartime enemy. It's not cynical. There isn't a, a secondary motive behind this. They're not trying to exert influence over a, an influential minority. They're not trying to bring these people to the U.S. They're not seeing value in these people other than trying to save their lives. So in subsequent refugee and human rights issues like after the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, the U.S. allowed Hungarians to come in part because of the Cold War. Yes. It's the same reason that we allow Cuban refugees in the 1960s. It's the Cold War argument. It's humanitarian, but there's also a Cold War aspect to it. There's nothing like that here. There's no evidence that this is created to oppose the Nazis. We're opposing the Nazis, you know, every which way we can. But this isn't being done just because of that or to add on to that. It's done because the U.S. decided to try to save some lives. The Treasury Department successfully argued what I've come to call the yes and strategy. Yes, we can win the war and we can do some good. We can do some humanitarian work even before the war is ending and it's not going to impede the war effort. That was one of the board's key strategies and key instructions is that they can't hurt the war effort. Right. And this is I think an important takeaway for like why this matters now, you know, this is obviously a fascinating story, but these very questions, as you said earlier, are, are in the air once again, and probably will always be in the air. But Mm -hmm. so why does this in particular, the kind of things we draw from learning about the WRB, why does that matter now in terms of U.S. policymaking and decision-making and choices that are being made in situations like this involving people at risk, people in war-torn zones and so forth? I think one of the the things that the War Refugee Board teaches us is that bureaucracy and red tape can be aimed at good things, that it can be used to help people rather than hurt them, that bureaucracy can cut red tape, is I guess is what I mean, rather than create it. And that a lot of this, a lot of the success that the board has is because they're creative, because they're networking, because they're not siloed. They're not afraid to to be brave and bold and to work hard and ask for what they want. And I think there is a tendency, perhaps, for bureaucrats in particular to look at their work and say, well, it's just me. There's not much I can do. Mm-hmm. And this is a story in which individuals inside and outside the government have a tremendous amount of power and make a tremendous difference. And so these are the stories of individuals not unlike us who are making choices to do the right thing and to stand up when they see things that are wrong. And I think it is an incredibly inspiring story. And there aren't a lot of inspiring American Holocaust stories. Right. And so, you know, there's obviously, you know, individuals who are risking everything to help refugees, but they are few and far between. The idea that there's a government agency trying to do it is, I think, a new story for a lot of people, but it shows that that is possible. It was possible once, even during something as catastrophic as the Holocaust and in a war as all-consuming as World War II, there was still room to do this. And so I, I think it shows that there is always room to do something, and doing nothing is doing something, unfortunately. Exactly. So, yeah. So... If we want to have another war refugee board, we can have it, but we need to demand it and we need to to work towards it. And we can't just sit and think that it's not our problem. Right, that it requires action, uh, both inside and outside the government. Well, Rebecca Erbelding, this has been a great and informative discussion. And I thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us at In the Pass Lane. Yeah, thank you so much. Rebecca Erbelding is the author of Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. Published by Doubleday and available everywhere. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcasts. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. 
Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, it's summertime. What's your preferred sunblock SPF? Zero. I'm protected by the darkness of my soul. SPI, Snoring Beagle International. Mm-hmm. <laughs>